Hi, Calvary Kids, and welcome to episode 13 of season 2. We're moving on to our new series this month called Unusual. What is normal exactly? Have you ever spotted a Sasquatch in the wild? Can you catch a centaur? Unusual animals are in interesting and unique, just like King David's story. It was unusual for David to become a king, and he didn't always get things right. But his story teaches us that God uses unlikely people and gives unexplainable joy. This month, we will use our imaginations to get to know an unchangeable God who does unexpected things. In this episode, we have three segments coming your way. First, we're going to talk about our big idea. Then we'll enjoy another Grow TV segment with Andy and Carl. And finally, I'll be sharing an object lesson in Kids Grow. But first, I want to talk to you guys about worship. I want you guys to worship God wherever you are. So I created a Calvary PTO Kids worship playlist on Apple Music and Spotify. These playlists are great to listen to at any time. You can worship God while you wait at the airport with your family when you go on that vacation after COVID, or when you're hiking with your closest friends, taking in the fresh air and enjoying the sun that's been shining this last week. You can listen to worship God wherever you want. For help to do so, go into the description under this video and there'll be a link there, or go to our website and the link will be in the Calvary Kids Ministry tab. Now let's get started in our unusual series and learn about this week's big idea. Today's big idea is God uses unlikely people. In this series, we are learning about how God uses unlikely people through the unusual story of a man named King David. The story we are learning from today is in the Bible and it's in 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13. It's actually the story of how, how King David became a king. So it's actually starting with plain normal David. And did he know he was the youngest of his siblings and watch over his family's sheep? Like a shepherd. While his brothers were warriors and tall and older and better looking, it's actually starting to sound very unusual that David became a king. Now let's give it to Carl and Andy at Grow TV to learn more about how God uses unlikely people. Hi there, old chicken nuggets. It's me, Carl. And I'm Andy. Welcome to Grow TV. Welcome to Grow TV. Hosted by Carl, where we have fun with our friends, talk about Jesus, and go over everything the Bible has to offer. Now, once again, welcome to Grow TV. I can't wait! I can't wait! <laughs> hey, Carl. Hi, Andy. How are you? Good. I'm. I'm good. You gonna ask me how I'm doing? Sure. How are you? <laughs> I'm so good. I'm so excited. Excited? Excited for what? Um, <laughs> I thought it was obvious. What? That I would be searching for the most elusive and sought after creature on the planet. Tony the Tiger? No, of course not. I'm talking about Bigfoot. Bigfoot? Yes, Bigfoot. It's now my mission to find him or her. You mean the mysterious eight foot creature that lives in the mountains and never been caught? Yes, ma'am. Well, even if Bigfoot was real, what makes you think you're qualified to catch such a huge, mysterious, and unusual creature? How about a letter from the guy who's in charge of the government? You mean the president? Yep. Well, if that was the case, I'd probably believe you, but I highly doubt the president of the United States would ever even... Wait, that letter's from the... President of the United States asking me, Carl, to lead the search for Bigfoot. Wow, Carl, I'm literally, I'm blown away. That's, um, I'm sorry I doubted you. That's crazy. No worries, Andy. I know it must have seemed pretty unusual. And that's our theme. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely pulled a David on me. <laughs> yeah, sure. Wait, a David? What does that mean? Well, the story of David when he was anointed as king, it was very unusual for many reasons. Oh, in what ways? Well, let's look in First and Second Samuel. Now David was a king, right? He was, one of the most famous. Well, who was the king before David? Good question. He was a man named Saul. Oh, I remember him. He was the first king Israel ever had. That's right, but unfortunately, Saul was not a very good king. But God was going to give Israel a new king. <laughs> All right. Well, now it's time for King David. You better watch out, King Saul. There's a new king in town. Well... What do you mean, well? Well, yes, King David was a warrior, but before he was known as King David the Great Warrior, he was known first and foremost as Young David the Shepherd Boy. Whoa, really? 
He sure was. King Saul was handsome. He was tall. He was a good warrior. He was basically exactly what you think a king would look like. <laughs> so you're saying I look like a king? Yeah, Carl, that's exactly what I'm saying. Carry on, my little subject. Well, God told Samuel, one of the prophets, that it was time to anoint a new king. What does, a, <clears throat> what does anoint mean? It was a special ceremony type of thing that people would do specifically for people who were picked by God or anointed by God. Got it. So God told Samuel it was going to be David? Not exactly. God told Samuel to go to Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse. Hey, I know someone that was from Bethlehem. I, it, it was a name. It, was, it was like started with J. Is it Jesus? No. Okay, you keep thinking about it. Anyway, when Samuel got to Bethlehem, he found the man named Jesse, and he found all of his sons, except for the youngest son, and his name was David. But David wasn't there. What was he doing? Like I said before, he was a shepherd, so that means he was out taking care of the sheep. Awesome, so what happened next? Well, when Samuel realized that none of the sons there were the ones that he was sent by God to anoint, he asked Jesse if he had any more sons. So they went and got David? They sure did, and when Samuel met David, he knew that he was the one that God wanted to be the next king. <laughs> that's so cool! So that's the end of the story? Not even close. You see, David was around 15 years old when he met Samuel. Wait, what? 15 years old? A king can't be 15 years old? That's a child! That's a baby boy, Andy! That's what made this so unusual. Not only was David really young, but he was the youngest son, and he wasn't even a warrior like Saul. He was just a boy who took care of sheep. And he's going to lead the whole kingdom of Israel? Yep, and this was just the beginning of the amazing story of King David. He became the greatest king in the Bible and a man after God's own heart. Jesus! Oh, right, the greatest king after Jesus, of course, yeah. No, I remember now, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, so... No way. Okay, you're right. But how's that possible? Were they related? As a matter of fact, Carl, they are, and Jesus was born into the family line of David. <laughs> wow, that's unreal. There's so much about David that I didn't know. Well, good for you. We'll be talking about David all month long, but you know what, Carl? What? You know how I didn't believe right away that you were chosen to be the leader for the search of Bigfoot? Well, people found David being chosen as king to be just as unusual. I guess I never thought about it like that. David was definitely a questionable choice. It's kind of cool how God chooses people that you wouldn't quite expect. They have such important jobs like running the kingdom. It is very cool. I mean, in the Bible, we see all kinds of people that get to do amazing things for God. People who had no remarkable skills, people who had physical challenges, people without impressive backgrounds, people who might seem unlikely to do great things, but God uses unlikely people. Amen to that, sister. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's our big idea. Today's big idea is God uses unlikely people. So let's say it out loud on the count of three. One, two, two three. three. God, God uses unlikely, unlikely people. people. Yeah. Right. Good job, everyone. Yeah. Andy? So I'm curious. About what? How do you expect to find a Bigfoot? Um, Andy, one does not find big, uh, Bigfoot. Bigfoot finds you. Okay, and how will Bigfoot find you? I will be using the Bigfoot call, of course. Oh. How do you do it? Let me show you. So basically, you have to put your thumbs kind of like that, you know, gently cup your hand, and you just kind of like it's it's a it's a it's a it's a tight squeeze, but not like too tight. It's just kind of like, eh, and you just kind of you open it up a little, and you just go here, big foot, here, big foot. Well, I don't see how that won't work. <laughs> Have a good week, kids. See you next time. Thank you for watching, and tune in next week for a new episode of. Thanks, Carl and Andy. Carl has been teaching us a lot about the Bible and real life application, like how to call for Bigfoot. Now, he said to put your hands together like this, but grip a little bit, but not too tight, and then go, and then you go, here, Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Bigfoot. Here, Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Bigfoot. Do not call for Bigfoot unless you are a trained professional. If you call, Bigfoot will come. Anyways, who knows what an underdog is? An underdog is a character in a story or a situation you don't expect to win. Underdogs are all around us. We see them in our favorite movies and television shows. We hear about them in sports events, kind of like the Stanley Cup playoffs right now. I think everyone would say the Montreal Canadiens are the underdogs. It's always the team or person that has a little to no chance of beating the other one. Sometimes you might even feel like underdogs. That's great news because God often uses the underdog. David was seen as a true underdog in the eyes of his family. 
but he was the one who God chose to be king because of his heart. As we stay close to God, God will use us to do great things too. So let us do that. Let us know that even though we might feel like underdogs, if we stay close to God, God will still use us. Our next episode, we will continue our series in Unusual, learning about David. I hope you enjoyed that lesson, and I hope to see you next Sunday when we continue to learn more about the Bible. Bye, kids. Hi Calvary, hi guests. We are so glad that you're joining us for church today. My name is Pastor Kathleen and I'm going to be your online host for the service. If this is your first time being with us, we encourage you to just send us a quick text new to the number that you see on the screen or visit calvaryptbo.church slash I'm new. We're really grateful that we're able to meet like this that even though you're not able to join us on campus, you are here right now to grow closer to God and hopefully to get connected to our community here online. At this same time, Calvary is also meeting on campus over at 1421 Lansdowne Street West. If you'd like to join us in person on any Sunday, you are so welcome. We are grateful for a large space where we can accommodate quite a few people in person at our permitted 25% capacity. So here's the scoop. For the next 45 minutes, we will sing songs of worship, take communion together, and have a teaching time where we turn to scripture. So feel free, if you haven't already, go grab something really small to eat and drink so that you can participate in communion with us. Now please join us by participating in your own way as we sing songs of worship to God together. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. We're going to spend some time in praise and worship this morning. So if wherever you're at, whoever you're with, if you want to just um, mentally, physically, um, literally put yourself into just a, a mode of worship as we sing these songs, whether they're going to be uh, praise or prayer, um, that we're also just knowing that we're singing these songs together. And so put some distractions um, away from you so that you can focus and just give God your attention over the next few minutes. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind 
We're going to take a time now and we're going to join with Pastor Paul as we go through a moment of communion. Every month we want to take time, step back out of the regular routine of what we do and we want to do what we call communion. Now communion for us is an open table. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're a part of Calvary Church or if you are a part of some other church. As long as you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we want to invite you to partake or enjoy communion with us. Now, communion is an opportunity for us to reflect back on what it is that Christ did for us on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection and the work that he did for you and for me for all of our sins to be gone forever if we give them over to him. But there's an aspect of communion that sometimes we pass over pretty quick, and I wanted to kind of focus in on that today. Because communion isn't just looking about the past. In fact, communion is also about looking into the future. So let me read from 1 Corinthians 11. Now Paul is the one recording this. He's, he's reminiscing back to a time, he wasn't there, but he was reminiscing back to a time when Jesus and the disciples were together in the upper room. And, uh, and, and he says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread and he had given thanks to God for it. 
Then he broke it in pieces and said, do this. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we look at this bread and we say, okay, this represents the body of Christ, the bruised, broken, beaten body of Christ for our sins. And then he goes on a little later on in that meal and, and he says, in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. And so, so we drink this together to recognize the new agreement, the relationship that we can have with God the Father because of Jesus Christ from that point forward of accepting him as our Lord and Savior. But this is the passage I kind of want to lean into a little bit at communion today. He says in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11, for everyone or every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. See, this is also an opportunity to eat and drink in remembrance, yes, but it's an opportunity to anticipate. You see, when we eat and drink together, we anticipate what God still wants to do, both in this lifetime and in the lifetime to come. See, we, we, can, we can rejoice today because of what Christ has done. Because it means that he is still active. He's still moving. He's still doing things in our midst today. So as we eat and drink together, may we do so in remembrance of him. Let's eat and drink together.
precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, who is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Always free indeed, oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor I to thee. We'll see the stones rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah. God be praised. He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross. My salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor to thee, praise and honor to thee. Praise and honor I to Thee. So God, we come before You today. We just thank You. We thank You for the gift of salvation for all of us. And we remember today as we eat and we drink together um, all that You have done for us. And we sit and we remember and we reflect but we also rejoice because you are such a good, good God. And so, God, we just come before you today. We thank you for who you are. We remind ourselves of those things, and, and we submit ourselves. We open up our minds and our hearts to what it is that you want to speak to us today uh, through Scripture. So we love you, and we thank you. And we all said, amen. Just a couple of announcements for you today. So our last Zoom room after party is happening today at 10.55. Chat with some other people from Calvary and maybe even meet somebody new. The link will be provided in the chat box and the comment section. As I was saying before, our live services are now at 25% capacity. We are so happy about that. Just register you and your family online for each service that you'd like to attend at calvaryptbo.church. Pastor Paul is developing a team of people to help with a refugee family that we would love to help get to Canada. He is having a development meeting on Sunday, July 18th at 11.30 a.m. It's going to happen in the Go Cafe here at the church and via Zoom for anyone who might be interested. You can sign up for this by heading to our website and clicking the Ministries tab. For those of you who call Calvary Church your home church, there are three ways to give. If you are a guest with us, please do not feel obligated to give at all. First, you can give online by just clicking the blue giving icon. Next, you can e-transfer donations at calvaryptbo.church. And lastly, if you wanna snail mail us, we are happy to accept it that way as well. That's all for me. Now let's get into our brand new series with Pastor Paul. I absolutely love summer. Like I, when I wake up in the morning and the sun's shining bright and the temperature is close to 30, I just smile and I say, ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. You are so good. Now listen, he, he's good in the winter too, but I just, I absolutely love summer. Now, hey, kids, 
Congrats, because, we are, because we're in the summer, that means that you've made it through this crazy school year. And so for all of those who are in grade eight or just graduated grade eight, or just graduated grade 12, you made it, congratulations. Now go and enjoy the summer because your new adventure awaits you in just a couple of months. Now for some of you, that means high school. For some, it might mean college or university, or maybe starting an apprenticeship, or finding a full-time job, or striving to live off your parents in their basement for as long as possible. Regardless of what your next journey is, it is definitely going to bring change. And while that can also bring some level of fear, but let this encourage you, you're not the only one fearful at the moment. A damaging byproduct of this past year has been a rise in fear for many people. This year has, has shaken our foundation of what we thought we knew or, or what we thought we needed. And we've become fearful, fearful of a virus that the common person can't even see. You know, it's gripped us so tight that this fearfulness is just, you know, there's fearfulness just by standing beside someone in the grocery store or walking past someone in the neighborhood or even, even visiting a family member or close friends for fear of contracting the virus or even worse, giving them the virus that I didn't even know I had in the first place. Then there's the fear of, of how to survive. Will my business make it through this? Will my position in the company survive? If I lose all that I have and what I have now, how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to pay for the bills? And with all the news lately about the residential schools, some may be fearful of even celebrating Canada Day and whether we should continue to hide our past or allow the truth to come out. Listen, fear has been real. But... It doesn't have to consume us. Over the summer months, we want to take a look at different situations throughout Scripture where fear is pushed aside and courage takes over. We want, we want to say enough of this fear crap. Let's gain the strength of Christ and be courageous in what he's asking us to do and how he's asking us to live. We want to be part of the bold and the brave. See, there are so many stories of courage throughout the scriptures. Whether it's Adam and Eve having the courage to pick up themselves after the original sin and learn how to live life as fallen human beings, all the way to the courage that the followers of Christ are going to need through the end times. See, courage is everywhere through the Bible. Now, I want to pick up the story of courage looking at Joshua. Let me give you a little backstory. Uh, right now. So Joshua was born in Egypt to a Jewish family. And for roughly, well, the first 40 years of, of life, he would have been part of the family business. Slavery. You see, at that time, the Jews were in slavery to the Egyptians. And Joshua would have been slinging mud or mixing straw or, and building bricks or, or whatever else they were forcing the Jews to do at that time. And it was about the time when he was 40 that a guy named Moses came out of nowhere and, and through many miracles performed by this new God that he calls Yahweh, Moses was able to free the people of Israel from slavery and send them on a journey to the promised land. The God of Israel had promised them centuries before this that he would give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And they had to hold on to that promise. Joshua had worked his way up the ranks and found he found favor with Moses and God because of his faith in God. It was only he and another guy named Caleb that believed that if God could bring them out of slavery in Egypt, then he could lead them to take over this new promised land. Now, at some point along the way, God spoke to Moses and he let him know that Joshua was to take over the leadership of the people of Israel after he passed away. That's what happened when, well, Joshua was 80. <laughs> he had been under Moses' leadership for 40 years, and now he was being tasked to lead the nation of Israel into occupied territory and claim it for their own at 80 years of age. I think that's a little daunting, but 
maybe, maybe not for you. Maybe you're ready to go. Anyways, let's pick up the story right at the beginning of the book of Joshua. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to read along. I'm reading through the New Living Translation today. Joshua is near the beginning of the Bible. It goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which is called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And then it goes from Deuteronomy to Joshua. And we're going to pick it up at Joshua chapter 1, starting at verse 1. And let's read together. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I am giving you. I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all these instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Try and put yourself in the shoes of Joshua for a moment. You grew up in slavery, but miraculously are freed. You aimlessly tour around this wilderness for 40 years as nomads, and now at the age of 80, your leader passes away, and you hear God speak directly to you. All right, you're up, Joshua. Let's get going. God makes it a point in his pep talk with Joshua to repeat to Joshua three times, be strong and courageous. It appeared through Joshua's life that he had a strong sense of confidence in the God of Israel, in Yahweh. But I think this time was different. You know, have you ever been with a, a young driver, someone who, who, you know, before they get their license, they're, they seem to have this level of confidence that, you know, I've driven a lawnmower before or I've, I've played uh, on a, in a goat cart or something like that. Uh, I, can, I got this driving thing. And then all of a sudden, there's, so, so there's this level of confidence that they have an awareness of what it you know, means that maybe they've watched you for years driving, and then all of a sudden now they are in the driver's seat. And, and they can't go beyond 40 kilometers an hour without thinking, whoa, we're going really fast. You know, and there's, it's, it changes. I, I remember I used to kind of have this idea of what being a lead pastor should be all about before I actually took the role of being a lead pastor. And I remember the day after being voted in as the lead pastor in here, all of a sudden this anxiety fell over me like I've never felt before in my life. You know, we, we can read all the books. We can talk to all the people, go to all the seminars of leading or driving or parenting or whatever else. But until you're in this situation, you have no idea the, of the weight of the position that you carry. You know, I, I think of our provincial and federal leaders through COVID right now. And I don't think they've done everything right, nor do I think they've done everything wrong. I just know I'm grateful I'm not the one who had to make all those decisions. It takes extreme courage to lead into the unknown. You know, the word courage, if we were looking at the Hebrew word, we could define it as a mental strength or determination. In my computer, uh, under the dictionary there, it says that it defines courage as the ability to do something that frightens one. You know, over the course of the summer, we're going to look at a number of situations where people stepped up with courage to do something. And, we're gonna, and we will look at a, a, a lot of different aspects of courage. 
and some great principles of courage. And there is no doubt that Joshua is one of those who stepped up with courage. But I actually don't want to focus on him so much for the remainder of this time, but on those around him. See, I think there are two key aspects that often launch courage in people. First of all, it's we read about it in, in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua knew he could be bold and brave because, first of all, he knew that God, without a shadow of a doubt, was calling him to do this. Can I say to you today that God still speaks to us? God is still calling out to you and to me, and he's saying, be strong and courageous. I have a work for you to do. And I want to empower you to do it. Not only did the directives come from God, but God promised jo Joshua that as he moved, if, if his moves stayed true to what God commanded the nation of Israel to do through Moses, then, then God would be with him. God would actually be doing the heavy lifting for Joshua. You see, God plays an active part in someone being bold and brave. Some of you have heard God calling you to be bold and brave, and you need to know that he is with you on this journey. He's not letting you down. Now, you may not be leading a nation. In fact, his call right now for you may only be to be bold and brave to share your faith with a complete stranger. Regardless of his call at this moment for your life, he longs for you to hear it. And not only does he want you to hear it, he wants you to know today that he is actively working for you, in front of you, beside you, behind you. You're not doing this journey alone. His courage can build and encourage you to go and do what he's calling you to do because he's actually doing the heavy lifting. The second aspect that often accompanies God's call is that confirmation from someone else. If you were to flip back a few pages in your Bible, Deuteronomy is the book right before Joshua. And in Deuteronomy 31, we see Moses giving his last charge to the nation of Israel. And it says in, in Deuteronomy 31 at verse 7, he says, Then Moses called for Joshua, and he brought Joshua up in front of the people. He said, he called for Joshua, and all Israel watched. And he said to him, Be strong and courageous, for you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors he would give them. You are the one who will divide it among them as their grants of land. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. See, God has a tendency to bring people into our lives to share with us God's call in our life. Maybe even before we can hear it ourselves. I think of back into my years of uh, before even going into pastoral ministry, my senior pastor growing up, speaking life into me at, at certain times saying, you know what, I know that this is a call of God. Confirming a call of God that I thought I had on myself to be a pastor. I think of another prof that I had when I was pastoring in London and kind of speaking into my life at that time, and in fact was very influential in the reason why I'm here today at Calvary. I think of another friend of mine who pastors out in BC and speaks, spoke into my life and shared with me different aspects of who I was that I didn't even realize about myself. And hence the reason I was really able to take the step to be the lead pastor here. See, sometimes these people may have realized something in me before I realized it in myself, but other times it's, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit uses people without even being known, without us even being known. I, I remember a couple of youth at different times coming to me over the years and saying to me, hey, Pastor Paul, remember when we were in your office and we were talking about this, or remember when uh, you preached on this, or remember, and I'll be like, mm, uh, sorry, I don't quite remember that conversation and they I remember one saying are you serious that was like monumental in my life it changed the trajectory of my life 
And, uh, and I was like, whoa, okay, so God, you're kind of cool. You use us in ways that we don't even realize to bring encouragement and raise up the courage in people at different times. See, God uses you. God uses me to help raise courage in those around us, in those in whom he is calling. Here's what I want you to take away from today. I'm not asking for you to recognize the calling that God has placed on your life and and to gain the courage in your life today. I actually want you to recognize that God is calling everyone around you to be bold and brave in what he is asking of them to do. I want to encourage you today to start looking at those around us and encouraging them in their courage. I'm not saying just throw compliments to everyone you see. But when someone is excelling in something, let's call that out in them. Let's help them see that God has given them the ability to be a servant leader, to be a great communicator, to be able to emphasize or empathize with others, to to have the gift of administration or discernment or working with their hands or working with children. And the list could go on and on for a really long time. You see, being bold and brave in the call that God has placed upon us is challenging at times. And you want to quit. And sometimes those words of encouragement come at just the right time to bring us strength to keep going. We can be used by God to bring courage to others. See, maybe, maybe, just maybe, if we choose to encourage others, we may just bring courage to the next Joshua in our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for those who may be watching online or maybe they're actually in the live service today and they're watching this. God, I thank you that they are here to hear this message because, Lord, we need to be encouraged. First of all, to know who we are in you. First of all, to know that uh, you are with us, that you still speak into us. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray that our ears would be open. I pray that our heart would be receptive. I pray that we would see the things that you want us to see so that we can hear the call. But Lord, I also pray that there would be those moments when you use us, Lord, to bring courage to others, that we could be like Moses was to Joshua, we could be that confirming voice in someone's life to say, yes, I see this call of God on your life. I see how you need to be working as a mechanic or a teacher or a lawyer or a business person or the list goes on. Whatever you are calling us to do today, would you bring those Moseses around us to bring life and courage into us, I pray. (coughs) In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Pastor Paul, for bringing us that teaching today. Here at Calvary, we really do want to come alongside of you as you follow Jesus. For practical ways that you can move forward in your faith, you can head to calvaryptbo.church slash next steps, or just email any one of our pastors from our staff page. I encourage you to use this time to pray and to determine how you will put what you have heard into action. Again, you are invited to our virtual lobby at 1055, where we will be taking time to chat with those that we are in church with today. You can do this by clicking the link in the chat box or heading directly to our website. Again, just a reminder that we are gathering in person on campus now, and we do have a limited seating available. So we just ask that you register beforehand through our website so that we can make sure that we have a spot for everybody. We cannot wait to see you. Thank you so much for joining us, and I really do pray that you felt encouraged and lifted up by being with the church this morning. We're going to see you soon.